everyone. <clears throat> I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of March 20th, 2024. Um, we have one substantive agenda item today, which is the fiscal year 2025 hospital budget guidance. We have removed the um, agenda item for the cop lead mid-year request. Um, there was some additional information um, board members uh, wanted, and they wanted more opportunity to evaluate and consider the request. And so we need a little bit more time on that. Um, I don't think we've rescheduled it yet, um, but we're planning to do so shortly if we haven't already. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Executive Director uh, Susan Barrett. Great. Can you hear me OK, Chair Foster? OK, great. Yes. Um, so first of all, I want to remind the board and the public that this evening we have our primary care advisory group. Um, we will be re review it. You can't hear me. I'm going to. I'm going to take my camera off. Is that any better? That's better. Um, we will be reviewing the hospital budget guidance with the provider, with the primary care advisory group, and gaining their advice um, on the FY25 hospital budget guidance. Um, in addition, we have several public comment period, public public comments open. I urge folks to please take a look at our page. Um, there's there there are five or six listed. But I will tick them off as a reminder. Um, first, the board is accepting public comment on guidance on the assessment of affordability in the review of rates. We ask that uh, folks who are interested in submitting a public comment that they do that by the end of the day on April 9th for board consideration prior to the board's review of this guidance on April 24th. There are materials linked on our public comment. Uh, website. Also, we, um, as Chair Foster mentioned, um, we extended the period to accept public comments for the Copley Hospital's um, mid-year FY24 budget request. And so please submit any comments by the end of the day on March 25th. Um, we would like those in consideration of, uh, of this issue before which will be before the board on March 27th. Um, we are also accepting public comment on the draft FY25 hospital budget guidance, so you, which we will hear more about today. And then the last two ongoing public comments or periods are on the community engagement um, for hospital sustainability. Please share any public comments on that process with us. And last but not least is any public comments regarding a next all payer model at this point, the AHEAD model. Um, any comments we receive, we share with AHS and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on that model. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, we have our meeting minutes from March 13th. 2024, uh, and I will move for approval of those meeting minutes. Is there a second? Second. And all in favor say aye. 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 And the minutes are approved uh, with four yay votes and member Walsh absent. Um, with that, I'll turn it to our hospital finance team for presentation of the 2025 hospital budget guidance. And that will be led by um, Elena Baraby, our Director of Health Systems Finances, and Matt Sutter, our Health Systems Finance Principal Analyst, and our Staff Attorney, Russ McCracken. Great, thank you. All right, I will share my screen. Let me know <clears throat> when you can see it. That's up. Great, all right. So today we'll review um, the modeling that we discussed last time. I'll note a couple of updates to the guidance. Um, as you know, it's posted publicly in its full form, so I won't be reading it to you here today, but I'll be kind of um, kind of going over the high level structure and some of the updates we've made. I'll talk about the uniform reporting manual briefly, the hospital budget review measures inventory and discuss timeline and next steps. 
Um, so <clears throat> there are these three materials that I kind of mentioned in the previous slide, but I want to kind of remind folks what they are and the purpose and how they work together. Um, so the FY25 guidance document um, specifies how budgets will be evaluated and criteria um, for whether they will be adjusted and kind of notes some of the kind of content areas that we may be looking at when we evaluate and analyze those budgets. Um, the uniform reporting manual create is a um, manual for standard definitions for financial and eventually non-financial reporting requirements. Um, we'll talk about this in more detail, but I think there's a lot of future work that we could do here to update this manual. We kind of did what we could this year with limited staff, but um, it's largely similar to last year's reporting manual. Um, hospital budget review measures inventory. This is a new document this year that kind of codifies measures that we've used historically um, or, you know, a, you know, some version of, of those measures or new measures that we've discussed recently um, and just creates transparency into how those measures are calculated, the data sources, the years that we would use um, that. And we expect to work towards visualizing many of these measures. I'm not sure how much we can get done this year, but um, this is kind of a long term effort and kind of step one. Um, in creating these materials and the budget guidance and benchmarks this year, we have been sourcing quite a bit of input and sharing different versions and asking for advice and guidance. Um, you know, we started this immediately following last year's budget process. I was kind of onboarding at the time, caught the tail end of the hospital budget process, um, but met with folks afterwards to hear how they thought things went and what could be improved. Um, we also met with the CFO group in November to receive some preliminary feedback on how last year's process went and um, what they had hoped for this year. Um, we had a series of meetings since then with um, hospital CFO subgroup, HCA, um, members from BAS, and um, a critical access hospital that looked at kind of various versions of the guidance and the metrics list. Um, and as you know, we've had a series of board meetings to discuss kind of the approach in general. And last time we met, we kind of went through in detail how we would structure the guidance. Um, and it's been posted now for, I believe, a week um, in its full form. <clears throat> so, and we're still opening open to public comments. So there's still time <laughs> to um, influence the process. Um, just a reminder that, you know, these materials together kind of balance what we hope to be a predictable but adaptable process. This is not a formula that, you know, we press a button and we have, we know what the perfect budget is. This is a really messy world and requires a lot of um, triangulating and trying to, you know, ask questions and understand broader trends and, and what's nuanced at the local level. So this guidance really seeks to optimize these things and, and you know, is certainly a, um, a movement in a direction and can be, um, can evolve over time. Um, so this is slide you should be familiar with. It's the same that we discussed last time. So really the section one benchmarks and the guidance um, will kind of be the first step. So if a hospital's budget meets those three benchmarks, um, you know, we wouldn't expect to adjust the budget unless there's something strange with the assumptions. Um, you know, the budget doesn't tie out or some major um, assumptions related to, you know, subsequent years are ignored or, you know, look strange, um, we might have more questions, but otherwise, um, you know, we would expect to approve that budget. We will still conduct a full review of all hospital budgets, even if um, a hospital meets all of the benchmarks, um, just so we can learn and, and but perhaps we, we um, and as I discussed in the guidance, there would be options for exemption to, um, for a public hearing if they, if hospitals do meet all of those benchmarks. Um, if the budget does not meet the benchmark, um, we will, you know, again, start with the budget assumptions and try to understand if those are reasonable. Um, and then we'll kind of look into the section two comparative analytics. So really thinking about, you know, why asking questions about what's different about this community or this hospital or, or what, you know, why would you need a higher rate or lower NPR or higher NPR? So um, I think that's that's how we're thinking about that. <laughs> So to Rich, last time we proposed, you know, keeping the NPR benchmark and tying this to the all-payer model growth target um, of 3.5 to 4.3 percent, um, and then hospitals would be expected to justify the benchmark, um, justify if they exceeded that benchmark in their budget. Um, 
we talked about picking a um, either 3.5 or 4.3 percent to have a, a clear boundary. And so um, I wanted to share some trends with you. Um, this is um, NPR over time, so growth from fiscal year 17. Um, so the blue line, blue chart, blue bar lines are actual NPR. Um, the purple line is the FY24 budgeted NPR that was approved. And the green growth line that you see there, the dotted line, is what NPR would have been with a 4.3% growth rate starting in fiscal year 17. The orange line is what the growth rate would have been at 3.5% growth. And, you know, we certainly know we had some challenging years in between. So um, these are just reference points. It's not saying that's where we should be necessarily, but it's to give some broader context. Um, and then the blue line is um, the um, is a inflationary um, index of, that's associated with um, growing or growth in healthcare expenditures or consumption of healthcare expenditures. This is a different You'll see PCE index this is a different index than what we talk about later. This is really about volume and price. The index we talk about later is really only about price. Um, so this is representing aggregate volume. Um, so the compounded NPR growth rate since 2017 has been just about 6%, just over 6%. Um, if we stayed at 4.3%, this would bring us to a 3.43 billion in 2025. If we stayed at the 3.5, so that orange line, we would be at 3.2 billion. And so the table below kind of shows, um, you know, what our benchmark would be if we started with 24 budget and added 3.5 to 4.3, which is what we've proposed in guidance. We're not saying we should go back to the 2017 rate, but, you know, we need to pick a threshold. Um, so, we're, you know, I think we've been growing a lot more than I think we all had expected um, uh, over quite some period of time. Ms. Barabi Kaska, can I interrupt with a question? Sure. Can, can you go? Um, okay, so the 25 <clears throat> line that you have here, that comes out to like 3.7 something billion dollars? Right. Mm -hmm. And so if we had stayed at the 4.3% all pair model target, we're about 300 million above that at 4.3 and about 500 million above that at 3.5. Is that the point here? Yes, that is the point of that chart. Yes. And this 25, fiscal year 25 number you have, that's at a 3.5% NPR benchmark. Yes, relative to that purple line, that fiscal year 24 approved budget. So that's how many additional dollars we would be adding to the system if we uh, hit that. Right. And this all needs to be taken in context, you know, with what we've grown, you know, the budget and then there's, you know, there will be actuals on top of that. So, our, you know, but we're building to the what's budgeted in 24. Thank you. Um, so this, you know, trying to understand why, why we're growing, I think we've spent a lot of time thinking about this, but um, I wanted to start with volume. You know, we, we hope that by increasing NPR, we'd be expanding access. Um, the chart on the left takes um, all of the New England states from the data underlying the Nashby cost tool that looks at adjusted discharges by state. So this is a, you know, a crude measure. It's not perfect, but what we're showing here is it's other than with the decrease in 2020, it's been relatively flat where there's not a huge growth in, in the volume of services being delivered um, in our state. Um, and that's consistent. Um, so the chart on the right is a exaggerated in visualization, but just making the point that it's been pretty flat over time with this decrease in 2020, but now in 2021, 22, we're catching back up to where we were before. Um, if you look at hospital admissions per 1,000, so at a population level, we know that hospital admissions um, have been declining um, over time, and this is a, a broader trend. And we know, you know, some of this is because we're seeing more outpatient, which you saw on the other slide is relatively included there, relatively flat. Um, when we look at what's reported by hospitals in um, the discharge data set, we see similar trend. So it's, you know, that dip in 20 and then it catches back up in 2021. You know, we don't have these data for 22 and 23. So it would be great to kind of see where we are now. Maybe something's different, but this is kind of the latest available data we had um, as we we're developing these slides. <clears throat> 
Um, so if we look at, um, you know, so we don't we don't think it's it's volume that's driving this growth, but if you look at expenses, you know, we have to to see with more recent data. But if you look at expenses, there's certainly a correlation between the NPR and expense growth over time. Um, so the we've added here this top green line, which is operating actual operating expense, um, with it trended to 24 based on budget. Um, so you can see <clears throat> how that has been increasing at a similar rate. Um, so if we look at operating expense growth, again, this is using the NASHP cost tool data and as aggregated to a state level. So it's it's total statewide hospital operating expense. So it's again, it's a crude measure, but you can kind of the yellow line across the top is Vermont. So we're you know much smaller piece, but we are kind of growing in line with um, other New England states. So if you look at the right, um, you know this is year over year growth in aggregate. Um, you know we're you know, kind of in in the middle there um, compared to other states. If you look at operating growth per adjusted discharge, um, you can see that Maine and Vermont are kind of at the, the top end of New England states, um, but in terms of growth, we're, we're rather consistent um, with, uh, with our peers across New England. When we look at charge growth over time, um, you can see that you know prior to 2020 there was it was kind of more moderate. 2020 happened, and then there was this big catch up. We know we had inflation and and a number of other challenges, um, and so operating margin, which is that green line, took a hit, and charges kind of spiked consequently. Um, and so you know we can see the real impact of increasing operating expenses um, on on charges and price. Um, so given kind of, you know, this substantial growth, um, a staff are recommending that we we stick to the 3.5% to kind of try to level things out over time. Um, and, you know, again, we kept the language hospitals exceeding this benchmark will be required to justify why they would need more than 3.5%. So this is not saying that 3.5%, that's it. You know, hospitals can certainly come in and say we, we need more than that, and here is why. Um, but the burden will be on them to, to prove that case. Um, we also discussed last time a benchmark for, you know, containing prices of healthcare services. So if we really, you know, step one, we say we really need more volume, but we're going to hold our prices down or, you know, improve or lower our prices. That would, you know, would be amazing. Um, you know, what is an appropriate cap on what what consumers should be paying for hospital services. Um, and so we we tried to, we came to you last time and asked, you know, what index should we tie this growth rate to? Um, what level of analysis should we peg this inflationary metric to? And then, you know, should we by payer, by care setting? Um, and we had this list of, of inflationary metrics um, that are quite common across a variety of sectors and in healthcare. Um, so the first one is really about GDP and price deflator. Um, the second one is CPI. The third one, which we're recommending, and many of these are quite similar um, from the consumer perspective, but you know others um, are more about industry and costs and um, supply costs. So we, because this is about you know, we want to have a consumer lens um, and make sure that we're thinking both about affordability and um, kind of health system growth at the same time we we adopted one of the more consumer focused um, metrics um, so the fourth one is a personal health care deflator um, projected by the NHE the fifth one is a PPI or the producer price index um, employment cost indices and Medicare market basket so we kind of explored all of these thought about how um, how they would correlate with what um, consumers can expect or can afford um, and how variable these are over time. And you can see in the rightmost column here are the kind of latest metrics that we would be thinking about applying to an FY25 process. Some of these are lagged, some of these are projections, so you have to keep that in mind. Um, but what we're recommending is the um, PCE price index plus 1%. We think adding 
you know, this is one of the more conservative measures, um, but adding 1% will kind of bring it in line with some of these other supply side inflators, but would also give um, some room to grow. So we know that this indicator catches up over time, but we know because it's a lagged indicator, um, having more wiggle room, um, especially as we're trying this out as a threshold um, would be appropriate. Um, then we wanted to kind of take some of the, I didn't do this for each of the measures, um, but, you know, uh, compared to Medicare market basket, the NHE um, healthcare deflator, personal healthcare deflator, and the CPIU. And what you can see is that this is actually a more generous um, threshold. So I took PCE price index plus 1% and subtracted the rates of growth from, you know, these other indicators. And what you can see is it's generally above except for CPIU um, in 21 and 22. And that is, um, so they're, you know, they generally hold over time, but CPI kind of bounces around a little bit more um, based on how, how it's calculated. So we applied this PCE price index plus 1% to charge growth over time. This is kind of a year over year look. Um, the blue bars it are the is PCE price growth plus 1%. The orange bars are what we um, ended up approving um, in the hospital budget process. Um, and then if you look at this from a three-year kind of cumulative average lens, so this is kind of smoothing, you can kind of see that it, it holds over time, but that we have um, approved, you know, a, a chunk higher than um, where this price growth indicator has been historically. So staff are recommending that as um, for the section one benchmark that, um, you know, we set this amount to price, um, the price inflationary metric plus 1% as of the January 2024 release, that's the most recent one available, um, which amounts to the um, 3.4% for FY25 over FY24. Um, so this cap would be a cap on commercial rate increases for each hospital above their currently approved levels, which also would apply as a cap on um, the, you know, that which hospitals may receive in price from each individual commercial payer. So we really want this to be net of utilization. It's really focused on price increases. Um, and then, you know, the GMCB approved rate increases will be capped. So there's still, you know, negotiation that would happen between hospitals and insurers beneath that. Um, and then similar to the first benchmark, hospitals proposing budgets that exceed this growth rate will be required to justify the request and report on productivity by department. Um, um, and then we... Um, in order to kind of round out some of the, you know, understand some of the assumptions related to rate increases across payers, um, we, you know, this is kind of in building on the previous ones. This isn't setting the benchmark, but reporting. Just wanted to note that um, we would expect reporting by payer for each major payer, um, but also by the core service line. So inpatient, outpatient, and professional services. The um, last benchmark included in section one is um, less of a benchmark, but more of kind of like a, a threshold um, for operating margin of greater than um, 0%. So that's just saying, you know, we expect that a hospital um, in order, you know, if it's going to be efficient, would have to manage its expenses. And we, we would expect that um, a highly efficient hospital would be able to both bring in sufficient revenue, but also be able to manage its expenses. Um, so again, this is just reiterating it's a similar slide to last time, but just that the section one benchmarks are what kind of dictates um, whether we do a full review um, with potential adjustment or or a full review. Um, and perhaps there, you know, might be some questions or reporting if something looks funny, but this is what will dictate whether we adjust a budget. Um, guidance structure, we tried to consolidate a little bit, so we don't have the monitoring section. We just kind of included it all within the contextual information section um, and then created another section to really detail hospital reporting requirements. So a lot of the previous sections discussed kind of general measures and data sources, but those some of those are public data sources, and we wanted to make it really clear like what the hospital is will be required to um, to report. So that's now in section six. But otherwise, this is largely the same. Um, 
you know, I'll breeze through some of these slides, which you've seen already, which is really the purpose of the comparative analytics section or section two. Um, so it's really to, to use, you know, series of data um, and trends to try to understand, you know, why a hospital might um, not meet the benchmark set in section one. Um, so this is really to facilitate a conversation. You know, we don't think there are, you know, two measures or three measures or a handful of measures that will adequately describe um, a local context. Um, so that's why we didn't set a specific performance benchmark. So it's really about understanding across a variety of financial measures and access measures and community level measures. So um, we think it's important to have a holistic view of what hospitals are dealing with on the ground. Um, this is a snapshot from last year's budget tool, you know, the types of measures that are included and, you know, feel free to, if you haven't already, I hope that you've looked through that measure set. They have kind of categories and tags and um, you can filter them, but there, you know, many of them are to do with revenue trends or operating efficiency, financial health, um, and they're labeled as section two in, in that tool. Um, section three will um, details kind of what we're looking for in terms of budget assumption. So being clear about, you know, what reimbursement changes are reflected in this budget or not. Um, payer mix changes, service mix changes, patient acuity, utilization, anticipated future capital investments or other material changes and assumptions that um, staff should be aware of. Um, the narrative um, we just created, you know, built on prior year, but um, tried to um, kind of organize them around background budget questions and then um, hospital and health system improvement. Um, this is just a snapshot from the reporting section that we kind of pulled out. So this filing checklist should look familiar. It's very similar to last year, but we um, are going through and detailing more detail for each of these individual items about what level of detail are required um, to be reported. Um, as I mentioned before, the uniform reporting manual. So now we're to this second companion document. Um, you know, we made a couple of updates this year, but it's largely similar to last year. So we defined bad debt and free care in accordance with the IRS definition. Um, we clarified some of the language around clinical and non-clinical FTEs. Um, and then I think we, we already started reporting in this way last year, but we were um, we codified kind of pulling out and separating the Medicare Advantage as as a like in the broader commercial. Um, segment and then defining major commercial payer for some of the previously discussed reporting um, in terms of Blue Cross Blue Shield, MVP, United Healthcare, and Cigna, um, and any other payer that makes up more than 10% of a hospital's commercial revenue. Um, we think there's future opportunity to improve apples to apples reporting between hospitals. Um, you know, certainly standardizing definitions in the uniform reporting manual would be a great starting place. So hopefully we can find some capacity to do that in, in the near future. Um, but I, I don't think it would solve some of the fundamental challenges and accounting differences. So, you know, if we ever really truly want apples to apples, um, you know, some of the ideas that have been floated, a single statewide auditor, or hospitals could adopt a uniform chart of accounts, that would certainly be a major lift, but those are, um, you know, just some, some food for that. Um, I did want to spend a couple minutes on the hospital budget review measure inventory. Um, again, it is also posted for public comment, so it's up there. Um, this is, you know, <clears throat> There are many measures included in this list we've used previously, and many of them are our standard kind of financial metrics. Um, the table to the right shows you how many measures kind of fall into each of these categories. So section one has the, you know, the three targets in, um, that we just discussed. Um, section two has, you know, a variety of measures that look at financial health, operating efficiency, revenue trends, um, and some other related measures. I believe the other is bad debt and free care. Um, section four has, so those are those contextual measures, um, detail measures on access and other community level data. Um, many of these are from publicly sourced or the Department of Health, you know, other standard sources um, and quality. Um, and, you know, so it looks like there are a lot of measures, but many of these, you know, we've used um, every year. Um, until now, and you know, some of these measures can maybe more or less relevant for certain hospitals. So, you know, it, it's it's really hard to tell, um, you know, what the if we were to narrow this down, who who would be benefiting or, or losing as a result of that. Um, and then I wanted to turn it over to um, Russ for a moment on related policies. Mm -hmm. uh, great, thanks, Elena. Uh, so two items I wanted to talk about here. 
The first is there's a um, <clears throat> amendments and adjustments policy that is a part of the guidance. Um, what we have a draft posted, it's mm, substantively um, the same as it was last year. There are a couple of changes, um, <clears throat> which I will highlight, but I, I don't think they're very material. One is um, there's a confidentiality section in that policy, and instead of setting out a separate process, I changed it to just refer back to the main guidance so that we're being kind of consistent. And the second, um, <clears throat> in the section about amendments, um, I changed some language to better track the statute. I, there was a reference in there to unexpected circumstances, but I changed that to unforeseen circumstances to follow the language that's in the statute um governing uh any requests from hospitals for a, a budget amendment um so that is posted for comment um but again it's materially the same as it was last year <clears throat> uh, the second thing i want to bring up for the board is that they there is a standing policy on um hospital budget enforcement this is not a part of the guidance it was pulled out of the guidance a couple of years ago and made a separate uh, standing policy that <clears throat> was adopted in March of 2021. Um, <clears throat> that policy largely tracks the enforcement provisions in uh, the board's rules in section 3.401. Um, the policy is really around the board's review of um, NPR variations uh, between hospital actual and budget. And the kind of the upshot of it is <clears throat> the section of the policy that says that the board may review hospitals whose year end NPR FPP exceed the NPR FPP requirement by 1% above or below their approved NPR FPP, um, that review will not necessarily lead to action by the board. So kind of wanted to bring this back for the board to think about, um, it was adopted uh, sort of at the, say the tail end of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, um, it may be appropriate for the board to take a look at this again and see if it still makes sense to have this uh, kind of 1% NPR variance um, as a metric for when the board would more closely review a hospital's um, NPR, uh, actual NPR. <clears throat> um, I, I did just want, also want to note that the policy as it stands is explicit that it doesn't limit the board's authority to review um, aspects of a hospital's budget other than NPR uh, performance, and it doesn't review the board's authority uh, to review a hospital's budget performance as a, at any time uh, as set out in the rule. Um, so if the board doesn't take any action, this policy will continue to be in effect. Uh, the board would like to review or make some changes to it, um, you know, we can certainly do that and uh, doing it in conjunction with the guidance might make sense. Uh, so I'll turn it back to you, Elena. Great, thank you. All right, and this is um, actually the last slide, so I just wanted to remind folks of where we were in the process. So we posted the draft um, in March 13th. Um, public comment is open through March 25th and then I think we've scheduled we don't expect a vote today we'd love to hear your comments and feedback and um, on and coming back next week um, with a hopefully final draft um, we have to issue the guidance before the 31st so really the end of next week is is our deadline um, but I will turn it back to you Chair Foster. Um, thank you. Uh, this is really impressive work, so thank you all very, very much. I know you've been working really tirelessly on this. 
Um, I'll turn it to the other board members for questions or comments that they may have. I, I can jump in first. Um, so yeah, first of all, big thanks to Elena and Matt and Russ and Flora. This has uh, been a big heavy lift over the last six months, uh, culminated in the last uh, crescendo in the last few weeks. So thank you for the hard work and for the, um, I think, needed innovations. I really appreciate it. Um, I really actually have a few specific questions on a few slides that I wanted to start with, um, just so that I better understand um, what we're looking at. So um, the first one is on slide 10. If it's possible to pull those back up, that'd be great. So just so I understand on the left, in the statewide adjusted discharges, are those, is that only inpatient discharges or does that metric include both inpatient and outpatient? It's inpatient and estimate of outpatient, so. It's inpatient, which allows us to estimate outpatients, so that's what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, but we don't, okay. It's not, and yeah, then, it's not exact, it's, a, it's an accrued measure, yeah. Okay, um, and then on slide, 13, um, where we show this um, really substantial uh, uh, rise in the operating expenses starting in FY22. Um, I would think, I just was, if you would comment on, I would think with this high operating expense above the actual revenue that we would have more hospitals with negative margins. C could you comment on on what the why we're not seeing more hospitals with negative margins? We have operating expenses that are far outpacing their revenue. I think we have quite a few hospitals that have negative margins. Um, so I or can circle back, but yeah. I, I think it's it's more than half now. Um, they're you know, may not be the big one, but many of our smaller ones are are really struggling. Or, I, or I guess the magnitude of of negative margin. I mean, this 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 line is. I, I mean, just estimating proportions. Uh, yeah. You know, in FY twenty three, the operating expenses look what twenty percent above the NPR. Yeah, I can, we can dig into that for you. I don't have that at the at my fingertips, okay. but I'm happy to provide more detail based okay. on our actuals. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then slide 21. Um, I was curious if you could, if you, if you don't have, but if you could provide, that'd be great. Just the aggregate growth numbers, the, the compounded growth of all of these, I guess the compounded growth would be the most yes. helpful. We, we, uh, almost stuck that in at the last minute, but I'm happy to get that to you. It does certainly smooth things out. Yep. Happy to do that. I can't hear you, Chair Merman, if, or sorry, Member Merman, if you're. Um... I still can't. I don't know. Is it just me? Can anyone else hear? No. OK. Um, how's that? Yes, I We're can. Back? We're back. All right. Sorry, I had a weird like audio glitch on this side, Bluetooth glitch. All right. Um, sorry. So on, and then two two slides down. I'm 23 and 24. Really, I'm trying to understand these. Um, and it's really 24. So if if we were to use this PCI price index plus one and we average this over three years, um, it's historical up until 24 what the board has done. And then in 25, we're estimating if the board was to apply the PCI, PCE index plus 1%, and we held to that, that the three-year system rate growth would then be just about 7%. Is that 
Is that, am I interpreting this information? No, we're we're we would we're not holding anything. So you're just showing we're just showing the PCE growth, and this is where our system actually ended up. So this is comparing where we actually ended up to what the inflationary growth was over that period of time. Right until until 24. Um, until so, yeah. Let me check those. Uh, yeah, until then, 24. And, I have to check the then, year label there. Yeah. And then I think, is this an estimate in 25 of where the system would be if we had the key? Because I think if oh, you Matt's look in the on here. Sorry, I'm going to ask Matt. Okay. Yeah, that, that. you're yeah. correct, Dave. The, or Dr. Martin, the, um, okay. yeah, the 25 figures on this slide with the three-year Kager, that's, that's a, for the 25, it's assuming 3.4% for all the okay. hospitals. Yep. Thank you, Matt. Okay, so assuming 3.4% for all the hospitals, a system growth of 3.4%. That we're seeing the three year average growth being about 7% if we use the 3.4% growth rate. Is that right, Matt? Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the compound average, yeah. But I think that's all I have for now. I appreciate it. I think I'll probably have some more comments a little bit. I want to hear what other people uh, in public comment. Thanks. I don't really have um, comments at this time. I so appreciate all the work that the hospital finance team has done. The data is really uh, enlightening um, in terms of the trends and the comparative analysis that was um, put forth. And at this point, I'm I'm more interested in hearing you know what other board members have to say. I'm interested in um, public comment. Um, and I think we have a week to think about it. So I want to digest some of these slides a bit. But I appreciate all the hard work. I have a couple of questions. Can you go back to the slide that has the, I think it's 10, the NPR operating expense? Just, oh, nope, sorry. That, yeah. <laughs> there, there you go. Sorry about that. 13, I didn't write it down. So, um, just following up from Dave's question um, related to the negative margins, um, I'm just trying to think through with the operating expenses where they are and the NPR, as many of the slides pointed out, it's the operating expenses over the last few years post COVID that have been driving both NPR and the charge increases. Um, so in thinking about how to move back towards a more sustainable growth rate, I would it would be helpful for me to understand how do you how do you start to reverse that trend on the operating expenses? So because to me, like understanding that piece, if in terms of picking 3.5 or 4.3, which is more realistic and reasonable given where actual expenses are today, understanding that there are things you can do to moderate expenses, um, but what is a reasonable trajectory? Like is, if I don't know if what I'm saying makes sense, Elena, but just mm -hmm. trying to think about like on the ground, what's realistic and reasonable in terms of, moderating the trend understanding that half the hospitals are in the red right i mean i think that's why this is a benchmark that you know hospitals can justify why they need more than that right so i think this is really about it's an aspiration <laughs> um if we don't set an aspiration i don't think we'll be able to reach that more sure. um reasonable growth rate so i think we really need hospitals to help us think about I mean, they're the experts in their operating how they operate, right? So I yeah. I can't tell them how to do it. I mean, that's why we're of doing course. this Act 167 work. Um, but I'm hoping that they can really come to the table and have some informed conversations about how we can all work together to do this. Thanks. 
Um, I didn't have any other questions about slides. I did have a couple of comments on the guidance document, which I will not ask you to pull up because um, it's too long. <laughs> so I'll just throw a few things out there. Um, uh, in um, in section D of the guidance, it asks for lots of really interesting information related to, uh, and this is my interpretation, so feel free to uh, say this is not what you were shooting for, but when I looked at it, it seemed like it was really trying to get at um, capacity for change, existing improvement infrastructure, existing efforts um, with the community. I think that's all good stuff. Um, I am not sure that it's that amenable in a narrative format. Uh, my concern is that either you get a 20 page answer or non answers. Um, and so I'm just questioning whether there might be another format for getting that information and having a conversation about those issues other than through the budget narrative. There are. If you went me on mute, but it. Another Sorry about format. that. Okay. Yeah, you're talking about another I format. I don't. And, I don't yeah. know how that happened since my hands were nowhere near the keyboard, but creepy. Uh, anyway, so um, yeah. So for I was wondering if there's another format we might consider to have a more of a conversation about those sorts of issues. Um, not because they're not important or interesting, but because it seems like the narrative format just may not be the best way to collect the information in a meaningful way. Um, there are several questions in that section that are directly applicable to the budget, um, but a lot of the other ones I would categorize as interesting, but not necessarily directly helpful to me making the two key decision points. So that's a suggestion. Um, just just because I think that I want the information, I just am not. I want it in the in the in a way that is most meaningful for everyone. Um, let's see. I had some specific questions uh, around a couple of questions in the budget section. Um, and I've raised this two years in a row about the facility fees question. I'm not, I still don't really understand why, why we're collecting this information and how it helps us in our decisions. Um, facility fees are driven by Medicare payment policy. Um, so I was curious if this is meant to be trying to get at commercial payers that may have adopted Medicare payment policy. Um, so that's just a question. And on the penalties to CMS question, are we truly talking penalties? Was it meant to capture, uh, for example, quality adjustments? Or I, I just wanted to make sure that we really were asking about penalties versus other sorts of adjustments that CMS might make um, and wanting to understand a little more about uh, that question. Sure. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think those were the the bigger questions I had. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and I'll I'll take those back and follow up next. Week. Thank you, Robin. If I can just hop in um, on that last question that Robin had, I do think it's important for us to understand if a hospital has received a penalty because of a quality, you know, readmissions rates that are too high from Medicare. I do think that should factor in as a, you know, an under something we should understand going forward. If it's happened frequently, if it's been, you know, readjusted back up, I mean, what is the process there? But I do think it's a, it's an important um, metric for us to follow. Thanks, Jess. I, I guess I wasn't seeing that as a penalty, more as a quality adjustment. So penalty to me means you violated something and there's a legal consequence. So maybe it was just me being overly technical and reading that term. So that's why I was asking the question. Right. No, it's a great question. And maybe the term should, I mean, we can work on the, the question better, but it was a quality adjustment.
Um, I have no questions. Can I drop question to um, Chair Foster, I believe you're hospitals that breaking are really up. close to the guidance for places that are. Um, I can't really hear you. I'm wondering. How's that? Is that better? That's a little better. Um, I don't need to comment. We'll go to the health. We, we uh, in the public, we have no idea what Chair Foster just said. I think he's he said, I don't need to comment. We'll go to the health care advocate. OK, that's what I thought I, I heard. Um, Thanks, Mike. Good, after, good afternoon, um, Sam Pudge for the Healthcare Advocates Office. Um, I'll, I'll be brief. I just wanted to thank uh, Elena, Matt, Russ, and Flora for some really great work. Uh, I will say, in my time at the HCA, I, this is the most evidence-informed and rigorous guidance that I, I have seen. Um, and I, I know they'd probably be quick to point out that this is a byproduct of continuous improvement over the years. Um, we'll probably submit a brief technical comment about an affordability metric that's a little bit different um, from one of the one that's proposed to be benchmarked to the commercial cap. Um, but at a high level, the main comment I want to make is about the process itself. The HCA thinks of defining success, a successful process as one that's participatory and not performative. And one success is not based on whether or not we get everything that we want, is whether or not we were heard and there were multiple clear opportunities for feedback in a transparent way. And we certainly feel that way. So we wanna thank the team for leading the process that is conducted that way and um, look forward to providing comment on it moving forward. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll turn off my video in hopes that it helps with my audio. Is that okay? Um, I'll, I'll turn to the public for any comment via the raise your hand function. Uh, Mr. Davis, please go ahead. Uh, Ham Davis. Can, can you hear me now? That's my fault. Can you can you hear no, no, me now? You can now? Yes, go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, yes, sir, we can. Um, OK, I have four comments. Uh, I'll go as quickly as I can. Uh, the first is that uh, consistently since th this board has been operating in its current configuration, which started in 2017, um, I think it's a huge mistake um, and it, 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 to consider this simply as a one as a, a system, one system of 14 hospitals. It's it has nothing like that at all in the real world. There's two systems, not one, and then maybe two and a half if you consider the New York side of UVM of uh, the UVM Health Network. But the the hospitals, the uh, the UVM network has a completely different business model from the uh, from the from the community uh, 11 community hospitals and if you and, and they operate completely differently and treating them the same is just going to get you in my opinion nowhere secondly one of the issues is one of the huge issues that is happening now and is confusing the legislature the administrative the the, uh, the uh, Scott administration the whole thing one of the things when you look at the cost, especially federal, uh, looking at federal benchmarks, the qu critical question is whether what, the, what you're looking at is age adjusted or not. If you look at something like the Kaiser Family Foundation numbers on, on which state is most expensive, Vermont is one of the three or four most expensive, okay? Uh, now, if you just take that, if, if, that's, just, if that's just raw data, okay, then that's one thing, but it isn't. The fact of the matter is that you that Vermont is one of the three or four oldest states in the union. The average the average age in Vermont is roughly in the mid 40s. Now that whether you use the average or whether you use the median, then that 
different as we as we all know but there's a but there is a but but there's not very much difference between them most states are average ages in the 30s and so by not using by not age adjusting okay then you completely then, then you're just not taking into account what the reality is Vermont is hugely old. It's even old. It's old, not just all over the state. It's old in Shetland County. I know something about it. I'm one of them. And so in any event, by not using, by not age adjusting, okay, then I don't believe a single thing that you have to say about what's going on in the healthcare system. It has to be age adjusted. Uh, number, th number three, uh, two years ago, Mr. Chairman, you told me that you you told me an answer, which I appreciated, um, that the huge volume of data that came in from something like 400 pages that came in from a half a dozen con national consultants into the Green Mountain Care Board on October 27th of 21. And you said specifically you weren't afraid of that. Well, I have to say that I think you are afraid of it because I haven't heard a word about it. What those what that data is talking about is is the quality that's going on in here. There's three different quality measures that all cohere to say that the UVM health network quality is way higher than the rest of the state, all of it. Um, and so you, you, the fact of the matter is you're not touching that. If you and if you can't use those, that data, okay, then you, then you're, you're not going to get anywhere trying to regulate this system. The fact of the matter is you're not moving the needle at all. The, 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 the actual way medicine is getting delivered every day, okay, is not changing at, at all according to what your board is doing. If you think it is, you're just kidding yourself. Fourth, the, uh, I'm almost done. Fourth, I'm writing a book about this, okay, and I'm just, and, and I'm going to, and what I'm going to, what I'm doing is I'm, uh, I'm uh, making all kinds of judgments. I can be wrong. I, I don't know, you know, I, whatever. I, people can disagree with me. In conventional journalism, which doesn't exist anymore, really anywhere in the United States, and certainly not in Vermont, but then the, it's a journalistic principle, okay, that you give the people you're talking about a chance to reply to what you say. They can object. They can tell you, they can argue with you. They can tell you you're wrong about something. And if you're a competent journalist, then what you'll do is you will listen and take all, all of that into account. I will do that, okay? But it's very hard to get through to people now, very hard. I, 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 get, I get called, when I make calls into your system, I, I get called back uh, one out of every 10 times. And mostly that is Kristen, who's doing a great job, by the way. Um, in any event, um, in, in any event, if you, um, uh, I, I will send when, when I'm, have a specific question for some for a member of the board or a member of the staff. I will send it through Kristen. I have already done that once for for for, for one member. Okay, but I will do it for all all, all, all the members. And it's your choice. It, I have no, it's nothing personal. You have I have no problem. Uh, have no problem if somebody doesn't want to talk to me. That is fine. I know a lot about that. I covered the whole. Nixon administration. If you think that journalism is a problem now, you should have been in the Nixon administration. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your comments and, and thoughts. Uh, Ms. Gutwin. Hi, um, I just wanted to make a comment about the uh, statistics, which by the way, I thought were well presented and, and most of it I could understand. <laughs> so. Um, that that says a lot in your presentation um, with the statistics looking at both inpatient and outpatient of a hospital um, and and separate from all the rest of the outpatient services of a community it um, it it's like looking at the cost of health care in a vacuum so if for instance, if services are shifting from inpatient to outpatient, but your your metrics only look at the outpatient of the hospital, and you're looking at expenses that aren't broken out between uh, inpatient and outpatient, um, you're not able to understand uh, cost savings that may, well, not may, that definitely exist in outpatient outpatient services that are non-hospital based. So 
um, I think it's a good sign that actually um, inpatient care is decreasing because for the healthcare system to um, save costs, if we can shift it to outpatient and in that outpatient shift, there is more affordable health care, then we're looking at an overall uh, decrease in cost to Vermonters. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see a way for the Green Mountain Care Board to do it just looking at the reports that I see because it doesn't include what is outpatient services, um, non-hospital based. Um, and I think that that is a good thing to look at, especially now because outpatient services, businesses um, are still at high risk of going out of business. I know that we have lost a spine business. So now the only choice patients have is a hospital-based um, spine uh, service. And um, the other thing too, for me, I, I have a knee injury and I, I wanna have surgery at UVM. And um, to schedule an appointment, you have to see the PA first. That's understandable, you can't see a surgeon. Um, their dates are three months out for the first visit. And, and then I called um, Evergreen Family Practice and they could see me within three days, which I did. And then same with MRI, um, that wait list is far longer than what I have, uh, which was within 24 hours. So it's critically important for the Green Mountain Care Board if, if you can't get reports on the outpatient services and every outpatient service the hospital provides can be provided by another business. If we don't consider that, then we look at the trajectories. We see the expenses of the hospital growing far, far higher than what we have in outpatient services of other businesses. So in other words, as I have said before, hospitals used to do hospital work. They used to take care of the sick and injured that couldn't be handled in doctor offices within the community. When the hospitals have encroached upon outpatient services, then what we have is a grab of of services that aren't more expensive to deliver, um, but more expensive. And I even wonder, I mean, I'm, I'm, my theory is if, if a business, a hospital has now both outpatient and inpatient, if inpatient is struggling, maybe their outpatient prices, the, the cost of now basically four times what you would um, have to pay to an, a non-hospital base, is to shift money from outpatient to inpatient. And I really think that hospitals getting back to focusing on their core duties and helping them to be sustainable, like we can sustain hospitals better if we basically allow other providers to do outpatient care where possible so that we can save money to raise the price of, of hospital services and, and inpatient in inpatient care. But what we cannot do is we cannot not think about these businesses in, in, in the outpatient um, realm that are non-hospital based um, because we had testimony that Blue Cross and Blue Shield says we can't raise rates to anyone when the hospital basically has the majority share of cost increases. So that's my comment, thanks. Thank you very much. Mr. Del Treco. Thanks Chair Foster and, and thanks uh, board members and Elena and your team. Um, him and uh, um, Susan, tough acts to, to follow. So I appreciate um, their comments as well. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we are in a um, pointing the finger conversation. I, I think we have, Vermont has an economic crisis on our hands. Um, Vermonters can't afford health care. Vermonters can't afford groceries. Vermonters can't afford gas. Vermonters can't afford their phone bills. 
Um, it is an across the board uh, problem. Um, this is the first time I've seen this deck in presentation like most. Um, I think the perception of um, uh, Sam uh, is not shared by me. I think we need more context. I think we need more work. Um, and if we look at the timeline that was laid out, I think some of it is insufficient. This is the first meeting we're having on the on the 20th, and we're going to salt and we're going to approve guidance in 10 days from now. Um, so I think we need more clarity uh, and more um, predictability in this space. Uh, when I think about some of the slides that I've seen, there's great uh, data and information. Um, uh, there's great data. There's not a whole lot of information. I'd like to ask why that operating expense growth is growing. What are the elements driving that? Um, it was stated that an organization that can manage um, operating expenses is highly efficient, and we are the experts. Um, however, when we do talk about those drivers and concerns, um, it's met with uh, those aren't realistic growth rates and, and we can't continue to grow this way. Again, I think we have an economy and economic issue. I don't think it is a solely uh, a one organization or one industry issue. Um, when I hear the comments around Blue Cross Blue Shield not being able to afford or pay other physicians, that's highly concerning to me. We, we need to look at um, the holistic picture and what is what is happening uh, and, and it just can't be one person gets paid versus the other. This is a, a race to the bottom. So I, I'd like to ask for a few things. One, um, we need to recognize what drives expense is when a patient shows up at our hospital. Um, if a patient doesn't show up, that's the cheapest form of healthcare. Um, and if, especially if there's care is delivered outside and they're not avoiding care, I'll just make that comment. So we are looking at how do we care for our community? We want vibrant communities around the state of Vermont in every rural corner, and we're focused on caring for our patients. Um, so I think we need to uh, deconstruct some of the information around hospital expenses and growth. Is, growth uh, Deep couple that from uh, what might be considered highly efficient. Um, and I know, Chair, I appreciate you being at our board meeting yesterday. There are 96 measures. There's no way on earth any organization can measure 96 measures, understand what they are. And I actually feel for the Green Mountain Care Board staff, how, how are you going to analyze 96 measures and, and be effective and efficient and productive at that? I think it dilutes the the point of the of what we're trying to do in a data driven uh, in a data driven way. Uh, furthermore, in that space of those metrics, um, I think there's challenges with some of the benchmarks. I think there's challenges with not knowing the inputs, the numerators and denominators. And I would like to avoid with at at any cost what we ran into last year during the budget presentations in uh, July, August and decision-making where there was a lot of confusion around those measures. So I would ask one that we, when we approve guidance that were that those measures and metrics are clear, I would ask for a reduced set of measures and metrics and benchmarks. And if that can't be accomplished within the March 31st deadline, I think there needs to be some reasonable no later than date set we know that July of last year didn't work for a timeline, and I would like it to. I would ask respectfully, um, you know, could we shoot for April 30th? Um, you know, as we move into uh, past April 30th, our organizations will start to be looking and 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 managing and modeling ahead model details, and I'm worried about the capacity of our organization. So I know I was long winded, and I, I don't usually filibuster like that, uh, but there's a lot here, and it's important. I appreciate the work uh, and collaboration, um, and I and I just think we need we we have more to do here, and we don't have much time to do it. So so thank you, and I appreciate the time. Um, Mr. Del I'll I'll have a follow-up question. Um, I'm sorry I can't be on video with my reception here. Um, have, do you have a set of the 96 measures that you would like to see removed or that the hospitals think are not 
productive or relevant? I, I um, thank you for that. I know that the, there's been a small work group uh, looking at some of those, um, and I and I think we can uh, work with Elena and her team on that because uh, I do think there's a, a many measures that are very important, and there are some I, I'm not so sure about. But but the answer is yes. I'm happy to work with you on that. Okay. Yeah, I, I would definitely be interested in which ones. Um, you know, you, you you think we should remove and definitely take that under consideration. So so send send that in for sure. I think it'd be helpful. Um, and then just for yeah, no, th thank you. And then the, for context, you know, the benchmark, the only two real benchmarks are the rate and the NPR. And the way I look at the measures is if the hospital is going to be um, above those these measures are something they can point to and rely on to justify that request. So, for example, if they're low cost, low prices, low expense growth, whatever it is, the justification for board members, I think, is strengthened, or at least for me it is. So they're really things to kind of help hospitals know what could be relevant to changing board members' minds to support a higher rate increase. That's how I think of them. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that, and thank you. And and again, I I think for us, it's about how do we our, care for our communities in the most effective way. You know, we're looking at healthcare in a very holistic way, uh, housing, um, what our what our local uh, city street uh, towns and city streets look like, um, workplace violence, um, patient safety, uh, and and those sorts of things. So I I appreciate that, um, and that's why I asked for a careful look at. We can't just say operating expenses are growing um, and a highly efficient organization could control those. I think there are multiple factors in play. Um, we are at capacity. I think we're looking at maybe some of the wrong numbers. When I hear we have three ICU beds left in a day, it, I, I am concerned about the care for Vermonters. So is it utilization driving? Um, expenses is it is it workforce never mind travelers but the need for more staffing uh, nurses doctors PAs um, environmental service people um, when I walk in these organizations and look at um, shelved cafeterias um, and places where patients can't get uh, a healthy meal I, I am concerned. Uh, and that's where we're headed. I, I'm and and I, I agree with the sustainability and affordability conversation but um, the, the choice is access, which is challenged, or 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 having creating more problems with those access uh, issues. I, it's it's simple to me, and it's very complex with all of the details. Thank you. Great, thank you, um, Mr. Stanislaus. Uh, thank you. I'm Mark Stanislaus from the University of Vermont Health Network, and I just would like to echo some of the comments that might. Del Traco said and and add on to a couple of them. The first thing I would say is this is a lot to digest. So I, I I just appreciate all the hard work, but this is a lot to digest. So I just have, have some high level comments um, for consideration. This is nowhere meant to be in, in encompassing of all of the comments, to be very clear. But uh, um, the first thing I would say is there has been a lot of reach outs, okay? And that is very, very much appreciated of the conversations from all levels of leadership, from the staff at the Green Mountain Care Board, to the members of the Green Mountain Care Board, to the chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. But there is a struggle to see how all of that, how all of that reach out and input carries over to this guidance. So, so I just have to echo what Mike said, because um, while not being in all of those conversations, but being a, aware of them, that doesn't mean that we don't have a common purpose together. But by saying that, I'm just reacting to, there was a lot of comments at the beginning to say, all of these reach outs happen. And there's a struggle to see where that feedback flows through this guidance. So I just wanted to share that. So I'm just gonna go through a very couple high level things. Um, I'm just looking at slide seven and slide eight, and there's a lot of reference here to the all payer model. 
And, you know, I know we could talk about percentages over and over, but we have to move to a per population based tracking. That's been said many years now for many times. That's what the all payer model is built on. We're mixing and matching stats here that are apples and oranges. So I just want to say that. Um, jumping on some of the ex expense trends too, I also think that needs to be population adjusted because if you just look at slide 15, there are some of those New England states that have out migration. There are some that have in migration, okay? <clears throat> and from an expense perspective, I think it's very important when we look at expense trends that are built into the hospital's financials that there are some expenses in there that should be carved out when we take a look at expense trends, okay? Um, well, there's retail pharmacy expenses that does not tie to net patient revenue. That is something completely different. There is provider tax trends. That's a cost share to a governmental program. There are other um, cost share expenses that relate to governmental programs. And if you were to take those out as an example, I bet you from 2021 to 2023, the actual expense growth would be at least a hundred million dollars less. So I think the expense items that are being shown as it relates to true hospital expenses and care to those patients that are seeking at the hospitals, um, I don't think they're fairly presented in some of these slides. Um, so that's something I would tease out there. And as we think about commercial growth rate and how we think about that and how we manage it, I would really caution the process that it would be best to have a conversation to say, why are those expenses in there? And when I take a look at slide 25, there's just some components of that in, in doing this business now for 30 years that it just doesn't relate to how, how hospitals get paid. And I'll just point out a couple of things that when you look at rate growth, it needs to be actual to actual. Well, there's no budget in there, okay? Um, um, saying that you need to look at hospitals productivity by department, when it comes, hospitals don't get paid by department, they get paid by encounter. So. You know, there's just aspects of this that even if we wanted to do it, I don't know how we practically could do it based upon how we're paid. And then if you just go to slide 27 and just kind of thinking out loud, it's, I think it should be, how do we create a sustainable healthcare system to meet Vermonters needs? There was very little in this on how do we balance some of these numbers against the care needs for Vermonters. That's ultimately, you know, what our shared purpose is. So um, uh, I think that is something because what happens when those against this guidance? How do we come together in a conversation? And there's no perfect answer here on either side, but there's nothing in this guidance about how do we work together to meet the increasing health needs and access needs of Vermonters. Um, and there's nothing in here about what does it mean to be a, sustain, a financially sustainable hospital and how does that balance against. So, and I have to say that uh, what Ham said, Aging has a big impact on the, well, the resources that it takes for hospitals to provide care to aging patients. They seek care more often. It's more intensive care. It's usually in a higher care setting. So um, there's no easy answer to all of this. Okay, I also wanna say that, but I think for us to work together to find a solution that we do need to put this down on paper on how we come together to tackle it together. There needs to be a little bit more of a strategic plan on how we do it together. Well, to just, well, to just reference one benchmark. 
And I would also like to remind everyone, there's some specifics in here about the commercial payers, but hospitals have a lot more patients. There's a lot more Vermonters that don't have commercial insurance than they do. So um, significantly more. So, so when we welcome the conversation on how we can balance all of this together, how can we, how can we make I think the affordability that you were trying to refer to is like, how do we can, how can we can control the growth of healthcare compared to other benchmarks? Um, but very much welcome the conversation. So I just wanted to point out some of those things and I'm sure that we're gonna be following up with some written comment. And I would just like echo what Mike said. There's so much here that anything that can be done to expand this deadline to fairly comment would be extremely grateful. And, 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 and I also think the Vermonters seeking care would benefit from it also. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. And any suggestions you have um, would be welcomed. So please definitely send them in. Um, I don't know the rules around extending the deadlines. I think it's in statute. I'm happy to look at that. Um, might make it tougher to get your budgets together because I know you're working on them now if this isn't done, but we can certainly, I would be interested in whatever suggestions you have to um, uh, recognize those points that you made. Is there any other? Oh, go ahead, Mr. Stanislaus. Actually, thank you, Chair Foster. Again, so like, I would just like to say something. When hospitals put their budgets together, The analysis done on this guidance is done afterwards. So us building our budgets or, or, or say you changing it, the way the hospital budgets are built is we anticipate what the volume needs are going to be. And then we build our budgets on top of that based upon what the current run rates are. So said another way, we take a look at the patients we are serving today, the patients that are coming to us because they need care and we take the expense relationship to that today and we build that moving forward. And there are some volume trends that are built in there. So, so you know, so I don't think if we extended this deadline, and there's a lot of CFOs on this call here, but I don't think it would impact the hospital but or how the hospitals build their budgets because you know we really focus on what the care demands are on the hospital, and then we build the budgets up from so. Thank you very much um, for the additional opportunity. But so I thought I would just kind of throw that out there because I don't think that would impact hospitals at all if that deadline was extended. Great. Okay. And I assume you're with a hospital? Yes, I'm with the University of Vermont Health Network. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay. Chair Foster, can I just ask for a, a quick uh, clarification from Mr. Stanislaus? He, he suggested modeling, removing provider tax, outpatient pharmaceutical growth, and there was one more area in it, and I was writing it down and I missed that. There's another cost share that um, um, were related to a governmental program um, well, that we can follow up on that's um, that I think everyone in the state, actually it is part of our net patient revenue. It is the GME um, IGT payments. So um, I think if you did those expense trends and when you took those out, you would see a really, really different trend line. Thank you for asking too, by the way, Dr. Merman. Um, I, I'm gonna follow up on that too, if you don't mind, just to make sure I, I get it. I mean, I understand that. Would we need to make adjustments to other states too for particular things, or would this is this are these on, only particular to Vermont? I know some of them are, or at least one is. Or do the other ones have other things that we need to change to make them apples to apples, or no? Well, um, I would say I'm not sure either way. I would say that there are a couple of those categories 
the um well, well like well like first of all I don't know what other expense or you know what other states what their provider taxes but at the end of the day there's a lot of comparison in here I'm saying this is the expense trend compared to the revenue trend okay so ultimately I'm just saying there are expenses in there that don't tie to the revenue trends okay and and so like well, well like all of the retail pharmacy expense that is built through like um, um, in other states we, we know and in this state it also goes through pharmacy so I don't know what their structure is but I'm telling you that that those percentages don't relate to the NPR trend so if you're going to connect those two um, and and also it also depends on if some of those expenses were already in their base before to if it's new so but I'm just saying it would be interesting to take a look at what the total what the total growth would be. And since the University of Vermont Medical Center drives that you know trend growth for the state, um, I just think you'd see a different uh, a different trend line in a lot of these. You know that doesn't mean where you it may or may not be where you think it should be either. So okay, that's helpful. Thanks for clarifying. Um, I think that's all we have for comment. I appreciate everyone attending and listening and sharing their views. Um, is there any old business or new business for the board? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Hi, and we are adjourned. Everyone have a nice day and I hope you get to enjoy the snow. Thank you. Of proposing its own methodology. So I think depending on what the state thinks is the right way to tackle that, we could try to negotiate something. So we could go into that sort of the considerations in more detail in the executive session about the you know potential negotiation levers. Um, I think that's all I have for now. I had a lot to say last time, so I'll pass to somebody else so it doesn't get too late here. Okay. Um, just a couple quick ones. Um, so, so far we've sort of been at the high level of sort of the goals and here's what we're trying to do and here's what, you know, is on the table. And I think getting into the substance and the meat of like how it's going to do those things and um, what the risks are and all of the more substantive points of how this would work, I think will be really helpful in in the coming months as we evaluate this. So, for example, if we talk about avoidable utilization and that's a key you know, component of making the program work well, what utilization specifically are we talking about and where is it going and how is it getting there, right? And so, for example, I mean, we you hear about it all the time, the problems with hospitals discharging patients. So if we're trying to avoid ED utilization or post-acute, put people in post-acute care that's appropriate, do we have that? And if we don't, what kind of risk does that create? And this might be like too simplistic, but I understand the whole theory. Um, but so you're trying to put more money into preventative care, but it, it's not so simple as changing the payment model. And then all of a sudden you'll have the preventative care or the long term care that you're going to need. So like a hospital can't just get rid of the orthopedic surgeons it has and add mental health and long term care and primary care. They have people that work there that do things and just rejiggering is, is much more complicated. So I guess understanding sort of the risks and abilities to, to make these changes so that the program and model works well would be really, really helpful going forward. Um, and then I think, you know, a lot of what uh, Member Holmes said, I thought was really thoughtful in terms of like the evaluation and the analysis of what we're doing. So I'm, I've been looking at bills that we get for our contractors and I've been looking at COAG funding budgets and it's in a tremendous amount of money. And I guess understanding what the financial investment is for the state to do it. And I mean by that, I mean, for us, for you really, Pat, who's doing the lion's share of this, God bless you. But 
just to do the application, to do the negotiation, to then come up with a regulatory process for then like hiring contractors to track all of the total cost of care and the quality, right? Then on top of that, for a hospital to be able to make the transformation, a hospital to have two budgets, a hospital to have two budget review processes, the Air Board to have two budget review processes. All of those expenses are quite massive, and I want to make sure we're understanding all of those. And they may be like a great investment because there are additional monies that are really important to the state here that we could get. But just really understanding them on a granular level, I think, would be beneficial. And then also considering the scope, right? Because if we're talking about whether or not it's a mandatory program or a voluntary program or whatever it might be, insurance, not insurance, all those costs are much better when they're spread out between 14 hospitals that are participating with full commercial participation, um, right? So they might not be bearable or worth it if it's two hospitals and no commercial. They might be a really good investment if it's the entire system. And then that also goes back to my first concern or question, I guess I should say, which is um, whether or not it will work and whether risks are to it working. And if it's only one hospital with 30, 40, 50% of its money, um, maybe it doesn't solve as much as we had hoped. So then there's an opportunity cost in that I know you, Pat, for sure, have no capacity to work on any other really substantive reform things. I know our staff and board members don't either. So, right, there's, so we can't do other things because we're very focused on this. And that might be the best thing we can do. Um, but if it ends up being a really small scale and scope, um, it's just something to consider. I guess the last thing I would just say is um, that access measures, the utilization points that members Walsh and Holmes made are really important to make sure that we're not losing access and that the model works for our access issues. Um, but then the protection for commercial and, and how do we make sure that we don't have really huge large increases on the commercial market here in the state that we've had for the last several years and how do we protect against that in this model so i don't have any questions if you want to respond you can pat these are just kind of food for thought things to kind of keep track of as we go ahead thank you chair foster i'll just respond very quickly um you know the question about um how we can address things like avoidable utilization given some of what we're seeing in the healthcare system. You know, we've touched on this earlier, but it's really a multifaceted approach where, you know, we look at um, what can the state do to help shore up those systems. And I can assure you that we're um, quite focused on that. Um, what are some of the investments coming into the system under a model like this? Um, and how can we best use them? And um, recognizing the longer time frame in this model, um, I think does show an understanding um, on the federal government's part that we're not going to be able to um, make these changes and solve all these problems overnight. Um, but if we focus on them, we can, um, you know, um, resolve them over a, a time period of a few years. Um, you know, yes, I think we have to look at what it what the um, financial investments required would be. And then, um, you know, your linkage of that to scale um, and participation levels makes it makes a lot of sense. And, um, you know, we have to determine whether it's um, something that we want to move forward with. And if so, how um, to encourage the appropriate level of participation. And then just would reinforce um, your last two points that access measures are going to be key. And, uh, you know, we want to know what's happening with utilization. Sure, if there's potentially avoidable utilization, are we seeing a reduction in those areas, maybe partly because of um, improvements in the system? Um, are there um, areas where we're, you know, where we would want to keep an eye on whether people are getting appropriate care? Absolutely. And um, ensuring that we can address affordability in the commercial market. 
um, is 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 essential. So thank you. Yeah, and so much of that turns on the negotiation. So you had on slide eleven, yeah. you have so many of the benefits, right? And all those benefits influence reimbursements, continued recognition, low cost care, baseline recognizes past savings, all of those, not all of them, most of those turn on what we get in the negotiation. So how much return on our investment as a state we get will really hinge a lot on what, what that negotiation looks like, I think. Absolutely, maybe, yeah. Maybe stating the obvious. Um, I guess I'm starting to get stressed about that as I'm sure you are. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for bearing with us all afternoon here. Um, you're really patient with us, and I appreciate it a lot. No, I'm happy to be here, and I'm, you know, an open door for questions. So thank you for taking the time. Um, I'll open it up to um, public comment via the raise the hand function. And Owen, I just want to say that I would like to go into executive session if we think we can save a few minutes for that. Yeah, but I, I think it's appropriate to, to do that yeah, after so public comment. Yeah. yeah, I didn't want to keep people waiting who have been patient. Uh, Ms. Wasserman, hey, how are you? Julie, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm there. Yes, I'm sorry. I just had to click on my camera and my mic. Thank you so much. Um, Boy, long day, lots to, lots to absorb here. And um, I have a number of comments I'd like to contribute. Uh, as you know, I already submitted a, a critique of the AHEAD model um, to, it, to you, and it went to the Agency of Human Services as well as the governor's office. Um, in that critique, I propose that we forego the AHEAD model. Uh, why? Uh, because it does not address Vermont's most pressing problems. And in my view, it will distract us from doing so. Uh, and AHEAD does not address our dwindling supply of primary care physicians. Um, people can't find a primary care physician. And um, I, I, it doesn't even even acknowledge that or address that. I suggest that you look at Pat's last slide uh, on primary care. What the Green Mountain Care Board's Primary Care Advisory Committee says, that, you know, there's 14 or 15 items. I suggest you look at that slide and check off the items on that slide where AHEAD will actually address the issue. Um, AHEAD does not address affordability, it does not address access, and it does not address wait times, as have been addressed, people have mentioned those today. Um, AHEAD does not address the critical lack of funding for mental health and substance use services. Um, and AHEAD also mistakenly focuses on fee-for-service and volume when the actual problem appears to be hospital prices. Uh, uh, many people are concerned about AHEAD's global budgets, uh, locking in current and historical hospital spending, uh, and it, it denies Vermont the opportunity to address arbitrary hospital prices, uh, reference-based pricing, um, extraneous hospital costs and unnecessary ER utilization. And all of those areas are areas for potential savings. And those are off the table once we go with AHEAD's global budgets. Um, and also under AHEAD's global budgets, hospitals could potentially withhold expensive care for patients who need it most. Uh, the AHEAD model will dramatically increase administrative costs and complexity, something that we should be working to do the opposite. It, it's a very complex, convoluted model, and um, it, it, it will uh, be very uh, expensive, as uh, uh, some of you have mentioned. Um, Regarding AHEAD's primary care investments, I'd like to suggest that the $17 million that has been um, discussed today uh, needs a thorough analysis. 
And, um, you know, is the $9 million from Medicare for blueprint in or out? We need to know that sooner rather than later. We don't, I don't think we would want to wait until negotiations. That's, that's a pretty important piece. Um, a third of Medicare enrollees in Vermont are in Medicare Advantage, so they're not even a part of that. Um, I don't know if they were included in or not in the 17 million. Um, another point is that hospitals are saying that they are not interested in participating in the AHEAD model unless AHS oversees their budgets. So if that's the case um, and the Green Mountain Care Board continues to be the regulatory, have its regulatory authorities over hospitals. Um, uh, and also hospitals own the majority of primary care physicians. There could be a pretty a low participation of a primary care physicians for that uh, $17 PMPM. So the, my point is that there's a lot of variables here and that um, I think it's dangerous to throw around the 17 million until we have a careful analysis of that, um, of that figure. Um, in addition, uh, we know that um, it, given the majority of Vermont's primary care physicians are um, work for hospitals, what guarantee do we have that those investments won't go to the hospital's bottom line? Now, the same thing happened with OneCare uh, and their primary care investments in 2023, 2024, and also in prior years. As we all know, there's a a pending uh, legal action, uh, but we still don't know if that roughly, I don't know, 20 plus million dollars uh, directly supported primary care as it was intended, or did it bolster hospital revenues? Um, most importantly, uh, there is great concern that AHEAD would in some way disenfranchise the Green Mountain Care Board by shifting oversight of hospitals budgets to the Agency of Human Services, and also, I might add, the hospitals. Um, uh, we need to clarify where the locus of hospital budget control would be with the AHEAD model before we move much further, because if AHEAD means that the Green Mountain Care Board is disenfranchised and does not oversee hospital budgets, uh, that would be a pretty significant piece of information to have in terms of whether or not we want to go forward. So I suggest that instead of pursuing the head model, Vermont should do uh, a number of things. I think we have a lot of options open to us, and all of them are within our purview. Um, one would be to strengthen and fortify Vermont's primary care physician workforce through aggressive recruitment and retention initiatives. Another would be to pursue initiatives that improve affordability, improve access, and improve equity. Um, I think that we could spend a fair amount of time in Vermont focusing on initiatives that actually reduce the need for hospital care, reduce the need for hospital care. We all know what that is. We all know that increased access to primary care, increased access to mental health services uh, and home health all would help to reduce the need for hospital care. Furthermore, we need to immediately increase funding for mental health and substance use services. A case in point, since August, the Howard Center has closed four programs and they've suspended an, an additional two programs. So six programs in all. Those programs are Center Point, Intensive Family-Based Services, Autism Toddler Community Program, Public Inebriate Program in St. Albans, Act One, and the Bridge Program. Now, is that not a wake-up call? <laughs> I think we have to pay attention to that. And I hope AHS is aware of this because as we all know, they fund the DAs. Um, other ideas for ways we can move forward is to standardize hospital prices through reference-based pricing. It's a proven uh, rate setting method. Um, we can develop initiatives to identify and eliminate 
avoidable hospital care uh, and unnecessary ER utilization, as I've mentioned. And um, one other idea is hospital capital expansion. It Hospital capital expansion is one of the big drivers of escalating costs. We could think about uh, creating a statewide global budget for hospital capital expansion. So in conclusion, uh, I think we should forego the AHEAD model, which potentially removes hospital budgets from the Green Mountain Care Board, hands them over to AHS, which I'm hearing wants the hospitals to set their own payment methodology. Uh, that's not too reassuring. Um, and also forego, forego the AHEAD model, uh, which will lock Vermont in to an untested model, untested model for nine years, nine years allowing for little to no progress on Vermont's most pressing problems. And it's, appear, it's, it's, it's apparent from today's discussion that um, there has not been enough analyses of what the effects of this model would do. Um, in fact, it's woefully inadequate. And I think in order to move forward, we need some analyses as, um, Chair, uh, as Member Holmes suggested. But one of the biggest problems of all of this is that there has been no public process on the AHEAD model. In my mind, it's a bit of a travesty to be locked in to an untested model for nine years without a public process to vet the merits of this initiative. Legislators, legislators have no idea what AHEAD is. The public, who we're supposed to be serving, has no clue. And, uh, let, and uh, even people in healthcare don't know about this nine year initiative. So I'd like to conclude by saying that we need to initiate a public process with all the affected parties, um, especially Vermonters, and the AHEAD model needs to be fully vetted in the public arena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wasserman. Mr. Flood? Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Chair. Foster, can can you hear me all right? We can, yes. No? You can? We, we, okay. we can hear you. I am having a little computer problem. If, uh, if the connection is not good, I'll shut off my video. Uh, but I want to add my voice uh, to those that are concerned, very concerned about proceeding with this model. Um, I have to agree with what Member Walsh said earlier uh, that this model is not tightly aligned with what Vermont really needs. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, this to me is just another uh, very complicated, very expensive uh, model that will take up all our time and energy and we will not get to dealing with the issues that are really need to be dealt with. There's no mention, really, there's no significant mention in all of this of mental health. There's no significant mention of long-term care. There's no significant mention of, of services like home, home health. And without those services being robust, all the focus on primary care in the world is not going to change our healthcare system. So, and uh, uh, I believe it was a uh, member Holmes who pointed this out that it, you know, if, if I can refer to effective services, then what have we accomplished? Uh, now, the 17, you know, dollars per member per month is very seductive. And in fact, it could be really helpful because it's one of the things that we know primary care needs. We know primary care needs. But we also know from what the doctors tell us that primary care needs a relief from the administrative burden. I see no uh, attention to that in this model. Uh, we know that uh, primary care, as I just said, needs uh, referrals to uh, effective services in the community. I see no uh, addressing of that in this model. There is reference to making referrals, but doesn't do you any good if there's nobody to refer you to. And I th think 
that probably all of you saw the recent letter from four emergency room doctors uh, who were pointing out just how bad boarding has become in our hospitals because we don't have services to discharge people to. And in fact, we don't have nurses in the, on floors enough to discharge people upstairs. That's how bad our system is getting. And this model is not going to solve those problems. And in fact, what it's going to do is distract us. We, you know, primary care has never been the problem in, in our healthcare system. Uh, it's never been the issue. The issue, as I think most of you actually know, is hospital costs. I heard you earlier about hospital pricing. It's if we don't, I don't see anything in this model that's actually going to deal with hospital the costs or hospital pricing. Uh, we know how to do it, as as Julie just mentioned. There are there are techniques we can use to do that. This model doesn't address it, in my opinion. I haven't seen enough evidence to it, and the whole avoidable care problem uh, is not addressed. It doesn't even come up. The word avoidable, the term avoidable care, is not mentioned mentioned in any of this. Uh, I, I have to comment that I, I appreciate the effort the board made in the past year or so to address hospital costs. Uh, and I find it very ironic that the thank you got for that was a bill in the legislature that was going to teach you to be decorous. Um, it's pretty ridiculous. Uh, we are focusing in the wrong area. We know what to do, and we're simply not doing it. Um, so what I would like to ask the framers of this model is for specific measurable outcomes. You know, don't tell me that Medicare is going to give us $17 per uh, member per month. Tell me what we're going to accomplish by that. Let's, let, before you approve this model, I. I think you should ask them for measurable outcomes, for example, like how many more doctors are we going to have in this state and by when? How many more people in this state are going to have access to a primary care physician when they need it and by when? I, I don't see anything like that. How many people in this state are going to have ready access to uh, highly affordable mental health care. But I don't think you're going to get answers to those questions because I don't think the framers of this model have even thought about it. But we need some kind of measurable outcomes here, uh, or I don't see any reason to, per to pursue this, this model. So <clears throat> I think you can tell, I, I, I really, we're going, this is just Another boondoggle. We spent eight, almost eight years now, start to finish, on the original all-payer model, and we have almost nothing to show for it, in my opinion. Nothing. And we're going down the same road again. So without a whole lot more evidence of accomplishment and a whole lot more uh, explanation of how we're going to solve the real problems Vermonters are facing, I think that this board should say no and not pursue this model. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have one comment in response, and I actually had a question. So one I've heard, obviously, of the interests in having the model regulated differently or not regulated or regulated by someone other than the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, I wouldn't support that. I think it would be a less attractive model if that were the case. I think the regulatory apparatus and structure is really important to make the model work well. So um, to that comment and question, I would I would not support that. Um, and then the question I had, um, reference-based pricing has been brought up a couple of times, more than a couple, a number of times since I've been here at the board. And I have to say it's quite attractive to me. I think there's a lot of fairness and predictability to it. And I guess the question is for either Ms. Garovich or Ms. Jones. In our design of our methodology, could we put in a reference-based pricing component? So some of our hospitals are very high, like 290, 300% of Medicare. Others are quite a bit lower. Could we set targets based on reference-based pricing and incorporate that into our methodology? Um, Did I take this? Oh, go ahead, Shirley. 
Sorry. Yeah, that's in, I, I think there are options to construct a global budget, right? So the issue is we start with the historical and how much adjustments you'd like to make. So that's one decision point. Currently, the way we were envisioning is that we do efficiency measures where we look at how efficient hospital is from their operational cost and then make payment adjustments accordingly to all payers. The issue with reference pricing or any controls on the prices that the rational behavior will dictate that they would try to maximize with higher utilization to maintain the revenue. So that's why an all payer rate setting in Maryland moved to a fixed budget model because A, as they squeezed the prices, they found out that their utilization went up, right? So at the end, that's the balance, but where you start is important. And there are options in incorporating some of those price adjustments if the state would like to go in that direction. So global budget concept is flexible in a way, right? So we are trying to control both prices and utilization at the same time. You can fix the prices as you start, or you can fix it gradually over time. So there are multiple options under the methodology. Yeah, so I think it's it's true. Our problem is more price than utilization. And so if you're saying lowering price gets you more utilization, which I understand, that sounds attractive to me and like a good way to go about it because we want more utilization. And, but want obviously, you know, let me let me finish. Uh, obviously, there's Sorry. a balance. You don't want to go bonkers, and then you're you're not there. So, how how do you design it such that you lower the price, get the utilization you need, but then not have it kind of blow out through the roof? Right. I think you're right. Like, how do you define what utilization you want? Right. So you don't want unnecessary utilization. Mm -hmm. So you don't want wasted services as well. And in the current model, if you just do reference based pricing, you do not have policy levers uh, to manage that aspect, right? Mm -hmm. So then it becomes the current incentives remaining, you squeeze down on one side and it will pop up in another. So there needs to be additional mechanism to orient the system to provide I would say a quality utilization rather than overall utilization increase. And that goes back to still general concepts around global budget and what you measure and where do you want the transformation happening within the hospital sector. Could you pay less for certain utilization above certain thresholds so it like minimizes the attractiveness of Uh, right, that goes beyond Medicare reference pricing, so that is kind of leaning towards more rate setting methodologies where you do determine the rates based on criteria other than the cost of services, right? So one is to cover the cost, and then you may want to say that, you know, we will provide more than cost for services that we deem needed or high quality or high need. Okay. Um, is there other public comment? And I, I accidentally, I skipped over the healthcare advocate, and I apologize. Hi, Chair Foster. This is Charles Becker. I'm here for the healthcare advocate today. We have no comments specific to the presentation. I would just say that we did uh, submit a comment letter to the board and to AHS at the end of. January, I didn't see that posted to the Green Mountain Care Board website, so maybe some of the folks here on this call haven't had an opportunity to see our letter. Um, and so perhaps I should email your 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 assistant to see if we could get that added to the to the website. Well, we'll double check on it on our end and we'll reach out if there's an issue. Um, I apologize. Um, we'll make sure we have it up. Thank you. OK, thank you so much. <clears throat> Thanks for Chair flagging Foster. us. Chair Foster, would you object if I made a couple of comments in response to Ms. Wasserman and Mr. Flood's um, comments? Please. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, just a couple of things. Um, one, um, you know, in terms of um, hospital budget review statute, it's very clear about where that responsibility lies. And I um, just want to um, clarify that 
um, AHS um, does not, um, you know, have interest in hospital budget review. So um, statute seems very clear. I mean, we're interested in the process and the outcomes, but we're not interested in doing it. Um, in terms of primary care access, um, I would, you know, just note that the idea in, uh, I go, totally agree um, that that's critical. And the idea that uh, of, um, you know, the investment in the AHEAD model, both in terms of overall statewide investment in primary care and the additional PM, PM payments um, would be to provide resources that would hopefully um, improve access to primary care. So just wanted to mention that as well. And, you know, agree that um, there, you know, there are other aspects of the system that aren't directly addressed by the AHEAD model, although um, the intent is certainly to um, see um, partnerships and resources with other parts of the system. And just to note, and I think we've covered it a bit today, but that there's, um, you know, this is, a, these are big problems and require um, multifaceted responses. And so, um, you know, AHS is certainly um, focused on Im improving um, so system of care and access to care in the system and so forth. So just wanted to, you know, mention that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I don't see any other public comment. Um, so I think I think we can wrap it up. One more, um, Kim Fitzgerald, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I'm Kim Fitzgerald, I'm the CEO for Cathedral Square and we're the statewide administrators of SASH. And so I just wanted to just make a comment that I, I really appreciate Pat's representation of the concern for SASH if um, we don't move forward. And I appreciate the mem board members bringing up, you know, contingency planning um, if, if we don't move forward um, with a head because we have not heard of any other um, funding mechanism for SASH moving forward outside of AHEAD. So I just want to appreciate the effort and energies you're putting towards to considering that. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your work there. Um, we were able to visit, uh, was it October or so? And it was really, really lovely. Thank you. Any other public comment? Great. Um, Ms. Jones, thanks for spending the afternoon with us. Um, long meeting and thanks for your patience. So, Owen, thanks if I know. could jump in, I don't know if people have time or appetite for oh, executive right. session at this point of the day. Um, so maybe we, I can bring that up in old business uh, next week. If It would be nice if Pat and Shule were there because I think they could provide some uh, important uh, additional information. Um, so I won't move that today, but I will just say a couple of things I've been holding off on saying, um, trying to make sure everybody else had time to talk. So uh, I think one, one thing that I just want to maybe provide some reassurance on is CMMI does not have the authority to change the state's regulatory process. That is purely a state law issue. Um, so I don't think that that is a possibility under the AHEAD model. In the discussion today, I heard a lot of conflation between commercial price issues and uh, Medicare issues, because I don't think that the, the issues are the same across every payer. And so I think as we continue to refine our discussion, we should be thinking about Medicare. And we have to think about the whole thing, but we also have to think about the payer specific issues. And I think with Medicare, as we um, have, we talk about a lot, the, the state compared to other state tends to be low cost. And so a risk there in the AHEAD model is we need to make sure that our total cost of care negotiation results in um, a reasonable Medicare total cost of care. To me, that's the most essential 
component to this, and that's something that's difficult to talk about in the public session because it it is so heavily negotiated. So that's part of my anxiety about wanting to do the executive session because I think I want to talk about that with others. Um, and I think to the points that others have made, like in commercial, the issue has been price. And so when you're thinking about, and in terms of the commercial design, like that is not a CMMI issue, that is a state issue. So we have a lot of opportunity to think through what makes sense for the state there. Understanding, of course, that will drive providers crazy if there's not reasonably aligned incentives. Um, so I'll I'll leave it at that given the hour, um, but I hope that we will be able to go into, oh, we don't have a meeting next week, so it wouldn't be next week, but I hope that we will be able to talk about the Medicare total cost of care considerations um, because I do think that for me, is the key component um, post negotiation that will need to be evaluated. And I'd love to share some thoughts about that. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe what it will make sense for us to do is actually just dedicate a full board hearing to executive session or something so people don't have to wait around for us to go in. And, you know, it's so it's off putting to me. I can only imagine what it's like to be trying to participate. And I did just want to give a nod to the public comment and the effort that people put in to, to critique and, and provide feedback. It is so massively valuable, right? I've said this for a long time since I've been at the board, really. Sometimes it's like the best thoughts and ideas are from my other board members, staff, guests, but also the public. So this is your own time as far as I understand it. And so thank you for doing it to try and help us make this as beneficial as we can or to make make sure we make the right decisions. So th thanks everyone for sticking around and, and doing that for us because it's really valuable public service. Um, all right, uh, any old business or new business other than Ms. Lunges? Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll move to adjourn, I move to adjourn. I'll second. I'll second. <laughs> all right, all those in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.